were singing that, I just felt impressed to do this. Um, is there anybody here that you need a touch in your physical body? You're not feeling you're good, you're sick. I'm not going to ask you to come down because the good news is, is that it says in the word that believers, do I have any believers in here? That believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. Is there anybody in here that just needs a touch in your physical body today? I just want you to raise your hands. I see some hands out there. Now, believers, what is your job? You're supposed to lay hands on the sick. So those around, just lay hands on them. I'm going to pray a prayer up here. And I believe that the healing of God is going to go into your body to affect a healing and a cure. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that healing power that 2,000 years ago you took stripes on your back so that we can be healed and we already are healed. And in the name of Jesus, that healing power is flowing in each and every body to affect a healing and a cure, driving out sickness, driving out disease, driving out pain. In the name of Jesus, every single person is healed and whole and complete and normal. We thank you, Father, for touching minds. Father, for giving peace to minds. Father, we thank you for touching chemical imbalances right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, we just thank you for your healing power. And we give you praise and honor and glory for it all in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. How many of you believe it? That you are healed. Now let me tell you what, in the Bible, there's different ways to get healing. Some people were healed instantly. Some people were healed as they went, and some people got better day by day. But what I do know and what the Bible does tell us is that this morning, at, right here at 1145, you got healed. And you are healed. That's what we all know. So no matter what you feel when you leave this room, when you leave today, you just keep on saying at 11.45 on Sunday, I was healed by the power and the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Woo. Praise God. God is good. Amen. He's here with us. He inhabits the praises of his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just all thank the Lord real quick. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being with us today, in our midst today, among us today, Father. And as we go to hear your word, Lord, we ask you that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be open to receive the word, and that our ears will be open to receive exactly what you have for us today. And we thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Well, it is so good to be with you this morning, Harvest Church. Um, I just want to thank your pastors, Joe and Misty. I am so honored that they asked me to speak today, and um, I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning. And uh, for my husband, Don, I'm glad he's here. He's my biggest cheerleader and biggest fan. We've been married for 23 years, and it's been an awesome 23 years. So, All right, well, this morning, we're just going to dig right on in, and uh, we are going to talk about love today, amen, and that's something that we can all use a little more of. I don't know if you've noticed, but this world has really just gone crazy, and there are, uh, there seems to be more and more, you know, kindness is hard to come by. It's more and more people are just angry and hateful and mean and rude and, you know, they do all kinds of things, right? And so, oh, I'm losing my mic here. Let me get this back on, okay? The glory of God just came in and just made my mic just fall right off. <laughs> all right. Um, you know... I was in a line the other day at a coffee shop back home, and, and so um, it was a really long line. A lot of people needed coffee that morning, and there was, the parking lot was super tight, and so I saw a car trying to back out, and 
So I didn't move up right away in the coffee line because I wanted to just be nice and, and give a chance for this car to back out. Well, apparently that was the wrong thing to do according to the car behind me because when I didn't immediately move up, this lady behind me just started honking and doing all kinds of gestures that we don't do or can't talk about in church and just getting really upset. And I thought, wow, she really needs some coffee this morning, you know, and so, you know, pulled on through the line. And when I got up to the window, I said, you know, I want to pay for the lady's coffee behind me because she, she, I think she's having a real bad day and I just want to bless her. And I don't know how that lady responded, but I hope that she felt the love of God through that act of kindness. And, you know, I really feel that's what's missing in this world today is simply love. And, you know, if you want to find a real angry place to be, you can just go on social media. Anybody ever on social media? There's a lot of ugliness out there. Um, You know, it used to be all posting, like, pictures of puppies and babies, and now it's just kind of crazy. But actually, there's a new emotion Um, And a new study that came out just a few years ago. And um, there's a new emotion called internet anger. Okay. Let me tell you about internet anger. This just kind of tells you the state of our world today. Um, It says that anger is the fastest spreading emotion online. The fastest spreading emotion online. It spreads faster than fear, sadness, or joy. And that anger is now being deemed as a viral emotion. And it was found who people, it was found that people who post angry comments online are more apt to experience anger in their day-to-day life. This study also says that just by reading an angry post will affect your mood all day long, but reading a joyful one has no effect on your mood during the day. That shows us that anger is a powerful thing. And we do not need to be controlled by anger. The good thing is is that God is the exact opposite. God is love. So I want us to go to the word and read a little bit about God's love. Let's go first to 1 John 4 verse 7 and 8, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified. I'm going to read several scriptures in the Amplified just because I like the way that it says it. Uh, So in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. The one who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. He is the originator of love, and it is an enduring attribute of his nature. Now, what I love about this is that God doesn't practice love, doesn't walk in love. God is love love. And when somebody is something, it's just in their DNA. They can't help it. They can't do anything about it. It's in their DNA. And God's DNA is love. It's an enduring attribute of his nature. Enduring means that it doesn't change. No matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, God is love. It's his very nature. And what I love about that is when we go to Romans 5, 5, we're going to read that next in the Amplified. It talks about this. It says, such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God's love, his very nature of love, his DNA was abundantly, everybody say abundantly, 
abundantly poured out within our hearts the minute that we decided to make Jesus the Lord of our life. We took on a new nature. We took on his DNA, and his DNA is love. And the thing about that is the minute that we became a Christ follower and made Jesus the Lord of our life, all of our excuses of, well, you know, I'm kind of impatient. That's just the way I am. You know, I'm just kind of rude. I just kind of say whatever I want to say. That's just the way I am. Well, the minute you decided to follow Jesus, guess what? You no longer can use that excuse because who you are has been changed and you can you are have you do have God's nature and God's nature is love and you have a new DNA. So now whenever things happen, you respond in love. Because God's love has been abundantly poured out into your hearts by the Holy Ghost. But the problem is, is that sometimes we choose to let that old nature, that sinful nature, that, that ugly nature come up and we respond out of that. Instead of responding out of the nature and out of the DNA that God poured into our hearts. So it's simply a choice. Love is a choice. But the wonderful thing is, is that it's in there, right? It does, it's not like, well, God poured it out a little bit. And, you know, as you serve him longer and longer, it grows and grows. No. The minute that you become a Christ follower, God abundantly poured out his love in your heart. So you have full access to the fullness of his love and the fullness of his nature from day one when you accept him as a Christ follower. That's good news. Amen. Amen. Let's look in Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2. We're going to read that in the Amplified. It says, therefore become imitators of God. Everybody say imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well-beloved children imitate their father. And walk continually, sometimes? No, continually in love. That is, value one another, practice empathy and compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. You know, it tells us right there in Ephesians to walk continually in love. And it tells us how to value one another, to practice empathy and compassion, to unselfishly seek the best for others. So this morning, just for a few minutes, we're going to talk about some of those qualities of love that have been poured into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. So first, love values one another, values one another. It doesn't treat people like trash or something just to be discarded. It values one another. Amen? Now, how many of you have ever gotten a new car? Anybody gotten a new car? And, you know, you get into that new car, and what, is it, what do you immediately get hit with? You get hit with that new car smell, right? There's nothing like a new car smell. They even have candles now that are new car smell. <laughs> so weird. But anyways, you know, but, you know, with a new car, you value that, right? You take care of it. A few, about two years ago now, two years ago in November, I got my dream car. I have been wanting this car for over 10 years, I've been just like every time somebody says, you know, well, what's your dream car? I immediately would tell them. So I got my dream car, praise the Lord. Now let me tell you, when I got my car, I valued it because I had wanted it for so long. And you know what? I didn't let anybody trash it up. Nobody's bringing their drinks in there because they might spill it, all right? It's not like getting on the leather and the carpet. I'm not stinking it up with McDonald's, all right? Because you, we all know that when we go through fast food, and I love McDonald's too, but it stinks in your car. It makes it smell bad. And I wanted that new car smell as long as possible because I valued it. I went through the car wash. I did everything. And 
sometimes the sad reality is, is that we will love and value a thing more than we do people. And we will treat people and say ugly words and, you know, make them cry and make them all upset. Oh, man, but we take care of this thing over here because we value it, right? But love values others, values others' opinions, values others' feelings. We're not going to say things that are mean and ugly and hateful, right? We value others, What's another quality of love? Empathy. Okay? Empathy is one of those big words, so I'm going to read that definition. Empathy is relating to someone else's pain and understanding the feelings of others, even though you might not agree. That's empathy. Now, you know what? Sometimes empathy is really hard to do, especially when you don't agree with somebody else's feelings. Right? Or you don't agree with their point of view. You know, our world has just kind of gotten real ugly. And man, if you don't agree with somebody, they just, I mean, like you're instantly their enemy. You know, I feel like used to, you know, you could have a normal adult conversation and hear somebody's point of view and say, hmm, okay, well, I can see where you're coming from. But, you know, that's not really how I feel. I feel like this and everybody was okay. But now, I mean, if you don't agree with somebody, it is like, no, you're a horrible person, Ah," you know, and they just come at you. We've kind of lost that. And we need to be empathetic and show empathy because that's what love does. Because, see, we're not all at the same place along the journey. You know, maybe somebody um, is a baby Christian and they have some things in their life you know, but we're helping them to grow along the journey, and we don't just blast them, right? We're empathetic. We say, hey, we understand that. We understand, and we help them grow along the way because we're, we are not all in the same place on this journey. You know, uh, our youngest son just went to college, so we're now empty nesters. And uh, my husband, he's all, he's all happy down there. <sighs> uh, yeah, he says it's good. I don't know. I still miss my babies. We have two boys, and they're mama's boys. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, last year, is my, uh, I was always really involved with my kids' school. And so last year, uh, my son was a senior, And so I was the class mom, and we were planning all these wonderful things, and I oversaw the committees. And so um, there was one mom, she had volunteered to put on this big, you know, function for the seniors in high school. So about a week before the event, I'm checking in, you know, hey, you got everything in place. And she said, oh. And I was like, no. (laughs) When I heard that, oh. And she said, oh, well, you know what, like, I've just, I've been going through some things. I've just been so busy. And I just, I wasn't able to do it. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to be able to help and get that done. And I immediately wanted to, okay, Denise's nature, I was like, well, you know what? I work a full-time job. Oh, you stay at home all day. Okay. You know, um, it must be a really rough life going to yoga classes and sipping on lattes all day while your kids are in school. Yes. No, I I didn't say that, but I wanted to say it. But I didn't say it. I didn't say it. And I showed love. I tapped into that nature that's on the inside of me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to have empathy for this individual right now. And even though on the outside it doesn't look like her life is that busy and I don't agree with what she's saying, I am going to empathize with her feelings. And I said, you know what? It's okay. We all go through things and seasons of life. Don't worry about it. I got you. I'll take care of it not how I wanted to respond but I knew that's how God would respond and so I tapped into that empathy that's a quality of love what else is another quality of love compassion compassion what is compassion 
Compassion is a feeling that arises when confronted with another's suffering and motivates you to relieve it. You know, Jesus was moved with compassion. Let's look over at Matthew 14, 14. We're going to read this in the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. See, the thing about it is that Jesus often, many, many times in the Gospels, he was moved with compassion, and then he did something about it because he knew he had the power that he was the answer to relieve that pain. And the thing about it is that we have that answer on the inside of us. And when we see people that are hurting and in pain, we should have compassion on this them. It should motivate us. It should move us to speak to them because we have the answer of Jesus on the inside of us. Instead of, you know, in our daily lives being so busy and focused on me, 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 and I got to do this, and I have my to-do list, and I mean, type A's out there, I'm right there with you. I have my to-do list, and I don't want anybody knocking me off of course. No, 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 don't tell me your problem today because I have got this many things to do. I don't have time. I get it. But what if Jesus would have been the same way? Because many times he was walking down a road on his way to another city to minister and he saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion compassion moves you to do something and we should be motivated by that you know just this weekend my son who's 18 him and some friends are going to the lake because it's labor day and they have an extra day off from college and so they loaded up in a truck and they, you know, had their music going, and so they stopped at a gas station at a quick trip, um, you know, to get grab some energy drinks for the road, and, and my son, he posted this story on Instagram, and it so blessed me, because you know what these 18-year-olds did? They saw a homeless man that was sitting there at the gas station, and instantly they had compassion. They had compassion, and it motivated them to do something about it. They knew that they had the answer, and that was Jesus. And so right there, they went out, one of them went out, and they knelt down, and they started praying with this man. And my son was recording it because, you know, if you're 18, if you don't post it on Instagram, it never really happened. And so you got to document. you got to document it. And he prayed with that man. And had compassion. 18 years old. Tell you what, so many people say that our young people are just, you know, in a mess. Well, you know what? I believe that our young people are going to change this world for Jesus. That they are going to change this world because they are hungry. They are hungry for Jesus. And us older people, we need to you know, shepherd them. We need to take them by the hand. And are those 18 and 19 and 20 year olds going to do some dumb things? Yes, they are because we all did that too. But you know what? I know I see a generation coming up in this church that loves God and is hungry for the signs and the wonders and the miracles. They are moved with compassion when they see people hurting and they want to do something about it. They are tapping in to the love of God on the inside of them. And we should go about our days looking for those, looking for those that need a touch from Jesus because we have the answer on the inside of us. Amen? Amen. What is another characteristic of love? It's unselfish. It puts others above yourself. You're unselfish. You put others' needs first. You know, my grandfather, Brother Hagen, um, he gave my husband and I the most wonderful piece of marriage advice and walking in love. And it has to do with being unselfish. So my papa, um, he would invite 
my husband and I over for dinner, and he was super intentional about spending time individually with his grandkids. And so we went over there for dinner, and we were just talking with him. We were newly married. And so uh, my papa, he always, he didn't cook a whole lot, but what he did is he always made breakfast for my mima. And so uh, my papa, he made fried eggs. Anybody ever have a fried egg? Mm, so good, right? Well, how many of you know that when you, when you make a fried egg, you have to be super careful because if you just wiggle it too much and when you're flipping it over, you can break the yolk, right? And that's like, that's not good. You know, you want it to be all intact. So when you take that knife through it, it just kind of oozes out all over your plate. And then you can take your biscuits and kind of sop it up. Mm, so good, y'all. It's almost lunchtime. Um, but anyways, okay, back to the story. So he would always make breakfast for my mima, and he always made fried eggs. And he told us one time, he said, you know, one of the secrets to a loving marriage is always give your spouse the best egg. What did he mean by that? He said, you know, I said, Papa, what do you mean? He said, you know, well, when I'm making those fried eggs, if I mess one up a little bit or it just doesn't look just right, I take that one for myself because I'm unselfish. I want my spouse to have the best. And that kept his marriage strong for a really long time until he passed on. You know, we should be unselfish. We should give others the best and let them have the best, even when it inconveniences us, even when it's a little difficult we should always let others have the best egg. Amen? Unselfish. What's another characteristic of love? Sacrifice. Sacrifice is putting aside what you want, what you desire, what you dream about to help another's desires and dreams come true. Sacrifice. Think about it. Do you think that God really wanted to give his only son for a bunch of messed up sinners like us? I mean, I'm sorry. I've got two sons. No way I'm giving them up to die on a cross for any of y'all. I'm just being honest, right? Just being honest. But thank God that he loved us enough to sacrifice and then Jesus, when he went to the cross, man, what an ultimate sacrifice that he gave his life for us. It was the ultimate sacrifice of love. You know, the, the, the least we can do is tap into that when he so sacrificially gave, that we can tap in and sacrifice to help others' dreams come true. You know, maybe God has blessed you with finances, and yeah, you could be selfish and take all that money, but maybe, just maybe, you could sacrifice some of your money and invest it to help some other person's business idea or dream come true. Wouldn't that be a great sacrifice to make just to show them the love of God? Hey, I believe in you so much, I want to invest in you. Sacrifice. You know, even with our spouses, we can sacrifice what we want to help their dreams come true. You know, I, I grew up in a home where my dad um, traveled a lot. He was a, an evangelist um, until he started uh, the his Rhema Bible Church, but uh, he still even traveled after that. But I grew up with my dad on the road, okay? He was gone a big majority of the time. Um, and so I have a great stuffed animal collection because... Every time he would go and travel, he would always bring me back a stuffed animal, okay? At one point in time, I had over 235 stuffed animals all over my bed, and I would, with care, set each one up. Um, but that was really hard on me as a child because um, I just felt so safe when my dad was home, and I really missed him. And so I determined long before I got married that when I got married, I was marrying somebody. They weren't going to travel. They were going to be there all the time, never leaving. Well, the problem is, is that I decided that before I, I, I got married. And so uh, my husband is a wonderful businessman. And so we were young when we got married. And 
he moved his way up in corporate America. And the great thing about that, he was able to provide wonderfully for our finances. However, what that meant is that he was gone a lot traveling um, internationally and then in the States. His last year in corporate America, he was gone over 230 nights in a hotel. So um, when he, you know, said, hey, Denise, you know, um, I've taken on this new promotion at work, but it, I'm going to have to travel a lot. On the inside of me, I was like, no, that is not my plan. Like, you can, I can't, no, because my kids are going to be sad, and I don't want them to miss their dad. I don't want them to experience that. But he's like, you know, I really feel like I need to do this. This is what God is leading us to do. So I had a choice. I could have been that mean, naggy wife and said, no. That is going to be too much of a sacrifice. I'm not doing it. You have to stay here. You turn down that promotion. You be here with me and the boys. Or I could choose to tap into the love of God that has been abundantly poured out in my heart. And that's what I did. And, you know, you know and the thing about love is it doesn't complain. It's not like, fine, you can do it. And then, you know, you're going to gripe and complain the whole time. No. I said, you know what? I'm behind you. I, I want to help your dreams come true. I believe in you. Yes, go do it. Go get them and be the best that you can be. And you know what? The thing is, is that God always graces you. The price that he asks you to pay is never greater than God's grace. The pri the, God's grace is always greater than that price. And God graced me with my boys I mean, I learned how to put on football pads. I learned how to play catch. I learned how to throw this perfect spiral because one of my sons was a quarterback and he wanted to practice. I mean, I learned how to do all that. And my sons and I, even when he was gone, man, we just grew so tight and so close. And I'm still reaping the benefits of that relationship today. See, God always rewards you. He's a rewarder of those who are faithful to him, and who are doers of his word, and not just hearers only. So sacrifice. Love sometimes requires you to sacrifice. And then another characteristic of love is kindness, being kind. And you know, being kind gets a bad rap, because a lot of times people are like, oh, well, those kind people, they just like mow right, they just, you know, people can just mow right over them. Being kind is weak. You know, a lot of, I, I hear, unfortunately, a lot of guys say that, like, oh, I can't be kind, like, that's weak, I gotta be tough, you know. But actually, actually, there is one definition of kindness, I'm really into the definition of words, and there's one definition of kindness, and when you study out all the Greek, when it says love is patient, love is kind, in the context of w that word, how it is translated is loaning someone else your strength. It's not like laying down and let people just run over you and do whatever you want, which is another type of kindness. But what the Bible is talking about in kindness is loaning someone else your strength. You know, I never will forget a few years ago, uh, my husband was building a new business. Um, my husband is just an entrepreneur of all entrepreneurs. I promise you he has like the Midas touch. Everything he touches just turns to gold. It amazes me, okay? It's just gold. And so he was starting up a, a new business um, endeavor. And, you know, anyth anytime you start up something, it requires a lot of work up front. And so he was really working hard, and he was, you know, a little bit, you know, kind of stressed out. And I remember one morning, I'm, I'm literally, I'm, I'm walking to get my coffee, because that's what I do first thing I wake up, I get coffee. And I was walking from our bedroom into um, the kitchen, and I was passing in the lawn, uh, through the living room, and the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and he said, I want you to start making Dawn a cup of coffee every morning and bringing it to him. 
The reason why I remember this is because I literally stopped in the middle of the living room and I was like, uh, God, I don't, think, I don't think so. That is not going to happen. <laughs> like, you know, I'm busy. I work. I've, you know, I've got kids to get ready for school. Like, he has two feet and two arms perfectly <laughs> capable of making his own cup of coffee. And I kept walking, and the Holy Spirit arrested me again and said, no, I want you to loan him your strength and be kind. And I was like, man, you know, it's kind of what I get up and tell other people to do, so I guess I would be a hypocrite if I didn't do it, right? So I said, okay, God, I'll do it. I'll be kind. I'll loan, him, I'll loan Don my strength right now because he's going through a season. And so I started making his coffee. We both like separate coffees, so I usually make mine and he makes his. So it was like a lot of extra work. It wasn't just actually pouring a cup of coffee. I had to do his whole coffee complicated thing that he does, all right? I got a machine where I just press the button, all right? But he has a whole thing. But I did it. I did it. And he was like, he was like, why are you doing this for me? Like after a few, you know, a few days, he's like, why are you doing this for me? I didn't say, well, God told me to do it. I told him to do it. <laughs> All I simply told him was, you know what? I just wanted to show you some kindness, just show you how much I love you. And so I did that for a season. I was able to be kind and loan him my strength. Who in your life can you loan your strength to? Maybe they're going through a rough patch, a rough season, and you have enough strength. And just for a little bit, you can say, here, take some of my strength. That is what walking in love and tapping into that love that God has shed abroad in our hearts. The minute we became Christ followers, but it is a choice, and I want to read to you some scriptures that talk about how your life will look if you're not walking in that love, if you're not participating in that divine nature that God has given you. And it is an ugly, ugly picture. And the thing about it is that, you know, people who are not Christ followers, who haven't made Jesus the Lord of their life, oftentimes this is what their life looks like. But as Christ followers, our life should not look like this. So let's read over in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21 in the message. It is obvious the kind of life that develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, repetitive loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on and on. You know, that's the type of life that we will be living if we're not choosing to let God's nature rule us. And that is ugly. And you know, when non-Christians live like that, you know, when they're rude and ugly and mean, they don't know because, you know, I never get upset with non-Christians for acting ugly because they don't know. They don't have God's love on the inside of them. I have all the compassion in the world for them and say, you know, hey, it's okay. They don't know. But Christians, Christ, follow, Christ followers who are acting ugly, man, there's no excuse. There's no excuse for that. We read at the beginning over in Ephesians that God's love has been abundantly poured out into our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It's there. There's no excuse for not walking in love. Our excuses are taken away. But you know, our life can look like this whenever we're choosing that. 
1 Corinthians 13, 3 through 7, I'm going to read it in the message. It says, if I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't have love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, it doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. That's what our lives should look like as a sacrifice of love. Because the thing is, is that what if this whole Christian thing that we do, it isn't about me, it isn't about you, but it's, a, but it's about others and changing others' lives by the love of God. Changing somebody's path of eternity by our love and responding differently and in love, we can change somebody's eternal destination. You know, I was ordering, I was in Arby's one afternoon on my lunch break, and you know, I'm generally a happy person, and so this individual was taking my order, so I gave him my order, and after I paid, he just looked at me and he said, why are you so happy? Like he was annoyed that I was happy. And I realized that was an opportunity to show love, to change somebody's eternal destination by the love of God that has been shed abroad in my heart. And I said, you know what? I can tell you exactly why I'm so happy. And I shared the gospel with him that day and changed his eternal destination. Because I really believe that's why we're here. That's what God has called us to do. You know, God came to seek and to save the lost. He sent Jesus to seek and save the lost. And we should be following in those footsteps. And with God's love that has been abundantly poured out in our hearts, we can do that. We can affect somebody's eternal destination. Just simply by sacrificing, by being kind, by showing empathy and compassion, we can change people around us. You know, we can walk through life just showing the love of God and change others. Because I really believe that's what it's all about. And I know today has been simple, but I think it's been a good reminder that in this world that's so angry and crazy and I think half the people have lost their mind, we can do something really simple on a daily basis. We can walk in love and change people's eternal destination. And what I know is that when we choose to let the love of God rule us, the love of God that's been so abundantly poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, when we choose to walk every day with intentionality and purpose, saying, hey, Holy Spirit, lead me to that person today that I can be kind to, that I can sacrifice, that I can show them empathy and compassion. When we let the love of God guide us and lead us and let that compassion rise up and motivate us to change another's life, when we do that, our lives will look different our relationships will look different. Our marriages will become stronger. And people's eternal destinations can change simply by an act of obedience to let the love of God 
that's already been shed abroad in your heart abundantly out to other people, just walking in that love. So I challenge you today, be intentional this week. Make it a point to find somebody that you can be kind to, to find somebody to show the love of God to, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your children, whether it be your coworker, or somebody random on the street. Make it your purpose this week to show God's love and change somebody's life and possibly their eternal destination. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for that love of God that you have placed in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we would ask you to lead us and guide us this week. Show us how to better serve others and walk in your love. Lead us and guide us to those individuals that need a kind word, a kind action. Father, help us to remember to show compassion and empathy even when we don't want to. Father, we commit today to serve others by loving you. And Father, help, help our spiritual eyes to be open to see those that need you and help us to show them you and how you love. Father, we pray this all in your precious name.